Dear viewers, it's come to my attention that more than one of you may have been traumatized by the cold open in my previous video in which I appeared to show reckless disregard for and wanton destruction of a large number of audio CDs. Well, let me assure you that the props that were ostensibly abused in that clip were professional trained stunt CDs that had already sustained numerous scratches, abrasions, and breaks over their long and worthwhile careers in the entertainment industry. Furthermore, as a devotee and connoisseur of the compact disc format myself, I can't stress enough that I would never deliberately damage, destroy, or even jeopardize any of the CDs in my own collection or any CDs that I believe would hold significant value to anyone else. If I did inflict emotional distress, shock, or suffering of any kind as a result of that clip, it was most certainly not intentional. Please allow me to take this opportunity to extend my most sincere and heartfelt apologies. Thank you for your time. one and all, and welcome back to Tom's Hit Parade. Today I am continuing my 2020 year-end spectacular-ish. This is part two of three. Uh, in my previous video, I talked about my second thoughts of 2019, albums that I discovered in 2020 that were released in 2019, as well as my most disappointing albums of 2020 and my favorite album covers of the previous year. And stay tuned, in my next video I will be revealing the big one, my big list of my 25 favorite albums of 2020. But today this video is all about me. In other words, it's about uh, the, it centers on the two features monthly features that I do on my channel, Backtracks and Bargain Bag. In a few minutes, I'll be counting down my 10 favorite Backtracks Spotlight albums of the year. It's a fantastic list. You're not going to want to miss it. But first, let's talk about Bargain Bag. Yes, a Bargain Bag, for those of you who don't know, is my monthly hunt for buried audio treasures in the form of two mystery CD grab bags from the late Skips Records and CD World, seven CDs in each bag, two bags per month. That means a total of 168 CDs that I pulled out of those mystery CD grab bags. Actually, technically, this year it was 167, because one title was a two-disc set in one of those chubby CD cases, which took up two spots in its particular bag. I actually ended up keeping 42 bargain bag CDs this year, uh, which works out to about 25% of the mystery CD grab bag contents, which is not a bad average at all, I don't think, considering how little I paid for those darn things. Now, the uh, I did a little number crunching uh, in reviewing the past videos, and my best month for Bargain Bag Keepers was actually January of 2020. I actually kept six out of the 14 CDs for that month, and the two worst months were June and July, where I only kept two CDs each out of those two bags. And also, uh, for as far as the timeline of uh, what's included on this list, uh, are the CDs in the breakdowns portion of each video from 2020. So in other words, that means I'm including the CDs I pulled out of and kept from the December 2019 bargain bag, but I'm not including the ones I may be keeping from the December 2020 bag because I haven't actually listened to them yet. But anyway, enough dilly-dallying. Let's go ahead and get into the list of my favorite bargain bag CD discoveries of 2020, starting with an honorable mention. And the reason this one is an honorable mention is, I guess, partly a technicality. Uh, it's only because I no longer have the actual CD that I pulled out of the bargain bag. I really liked it, but I did get rid of it uh, partly because it was a little bit scratched up, but also because I enjoyed it so much that I actually upgraded from its one the one-disc CD that was in the bargain bag to a two-disc set, and that is the Essential Alan Jackson. The CD that I pulled out of the bargain bag was uh, the Alan, ja Alan Jackson's Greatest Hits, a one-disc version. Yeah, Alan Jackson is, is one of those numerous artists who you don't realize how many good songs they have in their catalog until you listen to a Greatest Hits album. Uh, Aaron Neville is one of my more, more recent examples that I like to point out. But yeah, a lot of good stuff on here. Some, uh, you know, country, as I mentioned, is good for story songs. So a lot of those and some fun songs and some heartbreaking songs. Uh, a good collection. If you have not sampled Alan Jackson and if you're thinking about giving country a try, I would suggest uh, what, uh, him as one of the artists to, uh, to try out for your country uh, initiation. And now kicking off the actual list at number 15 here, we have this uh, compilation of uh, Great American Songbook Standards written by Oscar Hammerstein II. It's a fantastic set. Uh, so many big names on here. Uh, Joe Stafford, Judy Garland, Julie Andrews, uh, Louis Armstrong, Perry Como, uh, John Raitt, who happens to be Bonnie Raitt's father, and uh, Billie Holiday. I mean, just uh, it's all-star songs, all-star singers doing these songs. It's just incredible. And uh, yeah, as I said, I'm not a huge fan of the songbook, but hey, if I'm getting this CD for pennies, 
I'm hanging on to it. It's just, it's an excellent collection. Coming in at number 14 is a Danish band called Wolfkin with their album Brand New Pants. Yes, a, a fun, I, I mean, you can kind of tell by the album name, you can sort of tell that it's going to be a bit of a whimsical affair, kind of like they have a little bit of They Might Be Giants in them, just kind of quirky sort of alt pop more than alt rock, but they do have some rock elements in it. But yeah, catchy, fun kind of stuff. I, I would recommend checking them out if you can. Good stuff. And then at lucky number 13, we have a very obscure band. At least I had never heard of them before. Uh, maybe some of you have, but they were produced by a name that I definitely have heard of before. It's an indie rock band called Migs. Uh, this is their album 15th and Hope, and it was produced by, of all people, Phil Ramone. So yeah, one of the biggest names in record producing uh, produced this album, and it's great. Uh, it's fantastic. It's making me uh, want to check out and see if there's uh, any more of their stuff out there that I can... Uh, investigate but yeah a great set of songs i don't know what else to say about it other than that it's it's very good well crafted alt rock indie rock kind of stuff so yeah check it out next up on my list is probably the most unusual one out of all these uh, cds that i have here in this countdown and it is so unusual in fact that i actually was taken enough by it intrigued enough by it to do a review review of it in the following bargain bag video and this is bobby gaylor with his album fuzzatonic scream and he's basically what it is is it's spoken word stuff by him uh essays or and whatnot whatever you call them over hard rock instrumentation uh, kind of suggested by the title fuzzatonic it's got kind of fuzzed out guitars and stuff in the uh, um, instrumental track but yeah very interesting he does a, a routine about suicide it's actually a track called suicide which generated some controversy when it first came out and there's another one called tommy the frog killer which has to do with uh, he's uh, i guess one of his friends assuming it's taken from his real life it could just be a thing that he made up uh, a, a kid you know who enjoyed torturing animals when he was younger so very very weird stuff very uh unsettling topics that are taken on in this album but it's very very interesting very intriguing uh if you're into the really experimental kind of far out stuff i would recommend picking this up if you see it anywhere now number 11 on my list is a classical cd uh, another something different uh, kind of like bobby gaylor but in a totally different league than bobby gaylor uh, this guy is named james p johnson and uh, this is a set called Victory Stride, a collection of his compositions. And as you can see, he is an African-American classical composer, something you don't see a lot of. Since he's an American composer, uh, it wouldn't surprise you maybe to know that some of this stuff is kind of reminiscent of other American composers that have that same sensibility, like uh, uh, George Gershwin, uh, something like that. And also, piano is a central... Uh, instrument in a lot of these compositions. So take, given that in mind, it also wouldn't surprise you that he uh, bears a resemblance, his sound bears a resemblance to Scott Joplin, who also happens to be another African-American classical composer. So not a lot of you out there are going to care for classical music, but uh, if you do or if you're interested in it, and if you're interested in a part of history that I never knew about, I had never heard of this guy until I picked up this CD, which uh, I, I don't know if that's, you know, was engineered by... Uh, the people in power or what I, that, that would be another whole other discussion but uh, uh, to cut it short just give this guy a try if you uh, want to expose your ears to classical music uh, this would not be a bad place to start now coming in at number 10 on my list is Charlie Simpson with his album Young Pilgrim now th for those of you who may not be aware uh, Charlie Simpson gained fame in the UK much more than in the US as part of a punk pop boy band they played their own guitar so in that respect they weren't really a boy band they were called busted and they made two just two albums i think uh, before breaking up and uh, so yeah I, I saw this album when it came out but and, and i liked busted at first but they they did turned out to not have much of a shelf life for me and i got bored of them very quickly so when i saw this album come out uh, i ignored it for a long long time until it ended up in my bargain bag so i ignored it for what 10 years or something like that uh seven years and uh, yeah it was it ended up being really good uh it was not the punk pop stuff that busted was famous for charlie simpson on his own has much more of a dimensional sound uh more moody and and stuff so yeah very good stuff very good indie indie folk pop rock i guess that's, that's kind of a vague uh little packing too many genres there into one label but uh yeah just check him out don't be afraid to check him out he's he's a good songwriter a good performer a good singer a good instrumentalist so yeah i recommend him now number nine on my favorite bargain bag discoveries list of 2020 is a little bit of world music and hey we've had classical and spoken word and rock and roll let's have 
you know, let's throw world music into the mix too. Uh, this is a guy called Paul Prince, and this is his album Ocean Bells. And as you can see at the, I don't know if you can see it at the bottom, Hawaiian slack key and Zimbabwean guitar. So yeah, we have some sounds from Hawaii and we have some sounds from Africa. Very good mellow stuff. Great stuff for like, like a Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon when you're just sitting back relaxing and uh, yeah, uh, de-stressing after work maybe. Very, very good stuff. And kind of the icing on the cake for this was, and this is not indicative of its position, position on the list. This is completely a side note, but uh, whoever got this CD first, got it autog autographed by Paul Prince, and his name happened to be Tom. So no, this is not me that, he's, uh, that he autographed the CD for, but I just thought it was an incredible coincidence that this was in a Skip's bargain bag, and it was, you know, it was autographed to a guy with my name. So uh, bonus points for that, but that does not, that didn't bump it up on the list at all. So the, the music speaks for itself, let's just put it that way. And number eight is a name that probably most of you out there recognize. It is 98 Degrees. Yes, it's a boy band. I, hey, I'll confess, I have a soft spot for, for boy bands from the turn of the millennium. Although, strangely enough, 98 Degrees was not one of them. I disliked them completely back, back in the day when they were doing their thing, because uh, their only singles ever seemed to be ballads, and I was just not into the ballads. And besides, they just looked boring to me. I, I don't know I don't know how else to describe it, but they didn't seem to have the energy and the, the uniqueness of NSYNC or Backstreet Boys or the others. So I basically ignored them until I got the CD in the bargain bag, and it actually ended up being pretty darn good. Uh, it's, yeah, lots of good songs. They, I don't know why they seemed to only put out ballads as singles. Of course, that's the impression, the memory that I have. I could be completely wrong that they put out some upbeat singles. I just don't remember right now. But uh, yeah, I, I prejudged them. Good stuff. I, I yeah. If if you kind of like boy bands from the late '90s, early 2000s, and you haven't checked out uh, 98 Degrees yet, give them a try. You might like them. Kind of like I I didn't think I was going to like them. And there you go. Now number seven on my list is occupied by an alt rock group. Uh, they call themselves Beggars, and this is their self-titled CD. And this was one of the numerous uh, groups that I didn't hear about completely. Missed them when they came out in 1995. Was when this CD was put out. And yeah, it's good stuff. They actually remind me a bit of uh, one of my favorite groups from my youth called the Connells. Uh, some some great jangle rock. The Connells were kind of compared back in the day to R.E.M., uh, even though I've never really been able to cotton to R.E.M.'s music. But yeah, just the same vague sound of that. Yeah, uh, you, you'd find this, if you like R.E.M., give Beggars a try. Uh, good, good stuff. Good songs, catchy songs, and good lyrics, and all that stuff. All, all the stuff you'd expect from a major label CD. This was actually put out on Island Records, and I had never heard of them. So yeah, good stuff. Beggars. At number six, we have a compilation called Central Park Summer Stage. This was a set of live recordings recorded live at Central Park in New York. And yeah, a bunch of great stuff on here. About half of the tracks are um, Spanish language or otherwise uh, ethnic recordings. So, so you got a little bit of world music in here as well. But there are some uh, uh, English language, let's say, acts here. Uh, ben Folds and Guster join forces on the opening track. And there's a song by a, a rock group called NRBQ, which was popular back in the 80s and 90s. So yeah, this is an excellent comp compilation if you like a lot of different stuff uh, mixed together. Uh, and if you like live recordings, if you happen to be part partial to live recordings, you're in, you're in even more luck if you happen to be able to track the CD down. If you see it anywhere, don't hesitate to pick it up. It's just fantastic. And heading into the top five, we have Stir with their self-titled debut album. And I talked about these guys when I uh, unearthed the CD from a bargain bag. I've owned their sophomore album, Holy Dogs, for a long, long time. I love it. And I actually picked up this album back in the day, listened to it, and just it just didn't do anything for me, even though I loved their sophomore album. So I eventually got rid of it when I was hurting for shelf space, probably. But lo and behold, in a, a few months ago, uh, this was in the August bargain bag. Uh, this one showed up, and so I listened to it again. And uh, yeah, I don't know what I didn't hear in it those all those years ago that I heard in it this time. But yeah, really, really enjoy it. I still don't love it as much as Holy Dogs, but it is definitely growing on me. So yeah, Stir is a great alt-rock band from the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, so yeah, if, if, yeah, they're worth a try if you happen to run into any of either of their two CDs. Good stuff. Coming in at number four is Frente with their debut album, Marvin the Album. And I, I don't know why I ignored these guys back in the day. I've, I've known about them since pretty much since they started making music back in 95, 94. Uh, but I ignored them until now, and it was my loss. Uh, because, first of all, any band that has the whimsy to call their debut album Marvin the Album, 
it has got to be worth listening to, right? And, and it turns out they were. They, uh, they are fronted by a female lead vocalist, so that, that adds to, to their uniqueness, their character. There are far fewer female vocalist-led bands than there are male, let's face it. Uh, unfortunate fact that is. Being that a woman is uh, the lead vocalist, they give me a bit of an Edie, Edie Brickell and New Bohemians vibe, which is only a plus in my book because I really really enjoy that band as well, and Edie, Edie Brickell solo stuff. So yeah, this is not to be missed if you find it. Uh, yeah, it's a great album, alt-rock kind of, uh, alt-pop I guess more than alt-rock sensibility. So very, very, very good album. All right, we are in the home stretch. Uh, Ryan, you're going to be proud of me for this one. My number three favorite bargain bag discovery of 2020 is a Canadian power pop band called Odds. And this is their album Bed Bugs. And this was, I believe, their third album, if I remember correctly, on Wikipedia. Uh, good stuff. Um, I was into power pop back in the late 90s, I think. And this one was... Uh, oh, this was released in 93. So it, it would have been released before my power pop uh, uh, phase back in the late 90s. But, and I'm sure I had seen this CD sitting on the shelves, and I, I had heard of Odds before, but never given them a try and, until this CD. And it's great stuff. Um, Heterosexual Man is... Uh, the, the lyrics are satirical in that one, so when you, know, you know, when you read the lyrics at face value, you could be put off by it, but it's a satirical song. And, I mean, that's in the middle of the track list. That's, tra that's track six. But uh, Jack Hammer is the opening track. That's a great one. I mean, so many hooks. I mean, that's a hallmark of power pop music is great hooks and songs. And so, yeah, if you want a good time some uh, with a little bit of whimsy in the songs, check out Odds. Uh, I, I promised myself I was going to get some more of their CDs to try out, but I ha still haven't yet. But yeah, a great album and a, a good band, not to be missed. Now, I was talking at the beginning of this segment about a uh, CD that was in a chubby CD case that filled up two spots in its bag. Well, that's this one. That is my number two pick, although I have since transplanted it into a thin case. It is the soundtrack from Forrest Gump. Believe it or not, I have never seen the movie. I know. I, there are lots of movies I have never seen, lots of great movies I've never seen, but this soundtrack really, really makes me want to see this movie, even though I got this CD back in March and I still haven't seen the movie yet. And I've been in quarantine. I have no excuses. But yes, this is a uh, this is just a who's who, a, a greatest hits of the 60s. I mean, Elvis, uh, Dwayne Eddy, Bob Dylan, Aretha Franklin, The Supreme, Simon and Garfunkel, The Doors, the list goes on. I mean, if the movie is half as good as the soundtrack is, I don't know why I haven't seen the movie yet. But yeah, uh, and if you have seen the movie or, or heard the soundtrack or own the soundtrack, you don't need to be told how great it is. But yeah, fantastic thing. You, just, you can just put this on for a playlist and you're going to be entertained for, what, probably almost two hours. So yeah, excellent, excellent soundtrack. One of the best soundtracks, uh, uh, compilation song soundtracks uh, in my entire collection. And now here we have it, my number one favorite bargain bag discovery of 2020. It is Home, the debut album by Blessed Union of Souls. Now, this was another CD that I had way, way back in the day. Um, gave it up for either for lack of shelf space or lack of interest. I can't remember which. And for a while, I even owned their uh, singles collection, their Greatest Hits album, and like that. But And I think that was another one that I... Uh, just lack of shelf space. It wasn't one of my most cherished, most enjoyed CDs. So it went uh, and I gave it up foolishly. But thankfully, this was hiding in one of the bargain bags, and it's just fantastic. It is a, a mixed-race band, in case you didn't know. So uh, it has elements of rock, as well as, as their name implies, elements of soul in it. So it's a, a fantastic blend of influences, being that they are, uh, you know, some of the members are African-American, some of them are Caucasian. Uh, and I, there, there might be a, a third race mixed in with my but I'm not sure. But yes, excellent stuff, uh, I believe, is one of their biggest singles. And, and that really kind of encapsulates their sound. Uh, although they do have more more upbeat songs than I believe. I believe was kind of a mid-tempo ballad. But yeah, fantastic array of songs on this album. I, I don't know why I went and gave up this CD so long ago, but I am forever thankful to Skip and his Bargain Bags for letting it uh, come back into my life. So yeah, fantastic stuff. And I, this actually made me pick up their sophomore album, which was self-titled. Both great, great albums by a great, great band. Check them out immediately. Well, not right now. Wait until the video's over, but you know. Well, I guess 2020 was a pretty darn decent year for bargain bag CD discoveries, wouldn't you say? Uh, yeah, a lot of good stuff on that list, I think. And good stuff beyond the 15 that I mentioned on that list. Uh, plenty of other good keepers as well. So. And unfortunately, 2021 will be the final year for my bargain bag feature, uh, since uh, I was only able to buy that many 
of the mystery CD grab bags from Skip before he closed his doors permanently back in the summer of 2019 uh, for retirement. Yeah, he, he was fortunately able to close and do his big going out of business sale before the pandemic hit because that would have done the story in. But anyway, and yes, he is enjoying his retirement. So yay, Skip. I miss you, guy. But anyway, moving on to the other list I have for today's video, the arguably funner list, or more fun, however you want to say it. Uh, it's, it's usually more fun to me, and that is my favorite Backtrack Spotlight albums of 2020. And for those of you who may not know, in my monthly feature called Backtracks, not only do I run down or shout out the notable album anniversaries taking place that month, uh, in, in the years divisible by five, you know, their fifth, tenth, fifteenth anniversaries, and so on, but I also spotlight at least one anniversary album uh, that I buy on vinyl and I've never listened to before and have never owned before. And I try to buy it on vinyl as a means of, you know, further enriching my vinyl listening habits. Uh, and I, over the course of 2020, I actually reviewed 19 Spotlight albums, uh, more than the 15 in my first Backtracks year, but not quite as many as the 25 I somehow pulled off last year. Yes, I usually do two Spotlight albums a month, sometimes just one when I'm short on money or time or whatever. Occasionally I try more than three, and I did that uh, last year, and well, that was a mistake. Let's just put it that way. Uh, but anyway, uh, I crunched the numbers for this year, and it was kind of interesting. Uh, the most popular year target year, as I say, for Spotlight albums was 1985. I actually re reviewed six albums from that year. This was also the first year for Backtracks that I spotlit any albums from the 21st century. And I actually did three of those this year, two from 2015 and one from 2005. And I will go through this list a little bit quickly since uh, each album here, I actually did a more in-depth review in my Backtracks videos, which by the way, should be pretty easy for you since I do keep a running playlist of all my Backtracks videos, as well as my Bargain Bag videos, which uh, you can find those on the Playlists tab of my YouTube channel's homepage. So let's go ahead and get in without further ado to my list of my favorite Backtrack Spotlight albums for 2020, starting with The Honorable Mention. And this one is, uh, it's only an honorable mention because it's three LPs, it's a triple LP, and I just thought that well, it was a little bit unfair competition to put this directly in the running with the other albums on this list. But this one definitely deserves an honorable mention. It is The Epic by Kamasi Washington. My God, this is a fantastic album. If you love jazz, or even if you don't love jazz, if you like, uh, well, some of it is really kind of instrumental R&B in a way, and it's just fantastic. And I mean, you know, look at the lineup here. You got Thundercat on electric bass, Miles Mosley on acoustic bass. You got Patrice Quinn on vocals. I mean, this is just a stupendous, fantastic album. And it's three, as I said, it's three LPs long, but it goes by in a breeze. I mean, you put it on a playlist, it's going to be, uh, you know, on, on Spotify or whatever, it's going to be over before you know it. It's just a fantastic album. And uh, part of me is actually kind of regretting putting this just as an honorable mention. But as I said, a little unfair competition for a three LP set to go up against two. But yeah, excellent, fantastic album. And now kicking off the list proper at number 10 is Behind the Sun by Eric Clapton. Uh, this was released in 1985 and uh, a very good album. I, I, of course, I am familiar with Eric Clapton, much more just his uh, his more well-known songs and his singles. Uh, Forever Man was the, the, the more popular track off of this album. Good single, uh, but the rest of the album I was not familiar with. And one of the things that kind of uh, made me curious about it was it was produced by Phil Collins, which I didn't even know until I uh, did my research. But yeah, good album. I mean, 80s Clapton is not prime Clapton by any means, but still, even a bad Eric Clapton album is still a good album in general. So yeah, good stuff. Number nine on my list is one of actually all three of the 21st century anniversary albums I mentioned a minute ago are on this list somewhere, so spoiler alert, I guess you'd say. But yes, this is one of them. It is I Love You, Honey Bear by Father John Misty. And uh, I confess, I do still need to absorb this one more. I've only had a chance to listen to it a few times over the year. Uh, but in, And that's one thing that, from what I understand about Father John Misty albums, this was my first exposure to Father John Misty, by the way, is that his albums... They're, they grow on you. You're not going to be won over by them by on first listen. and uh, But yeah, this was a, a very good dimensional album. Uh, lots of different sounds on it and uh, very, very witty lyrics and uh, uh, very, lots of wry humor in the lyrics and, and self-deprecating humor in some places. So yeah, good stuff, but it is it is not light listening, really. But uh, yeah, otherwise it might have been higher on my list because I guess I kind of needed more light listening this year, I guess you'd say. But yeah, still a very, very good album and I'm, I'm gonna investigate his discography much more. I've heard really good things about pure comedy. I need to check that one out too. 
Coming in at number eight is Gordon Lightfoot with his album If You Could Read My Mind. Uh, also known as Sit Down Young Stranger, it was it was released with that title in, was it on other pressings or in other areas, possibly in his homeland of Canada? I can't remember, but it's, it's known by both titles. But yeah, good stuff. Great uh, singer-songwriter stuff. I had never really paid attention to Gordon Lightfoot, even though I had heard of him forever ago. But uh, yeah, fine stuff. And I've, uh, I think this was my first album exposure to him, and I found on the freebie shelf, uh, sad to say, I mean, I don't know why people are just casting off his records, but uh, several more albums this year on the freebie shelf at House of Records, and I've, I've enjoyed, to some measure, each and every one of his albums. So yeah, a very underrated 70s singer-songwriter, folk, folk pop artist. Yeah, but great stuff. If, if you have an opportunity, opportunity to check out Gordon Lightfoot uh, in detail, I recommend it. Now, taking the number seven spot in my countdown is actually the oldest Spotlight album that I reviewed this year. It was released back in 1965. It is the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, their self-titled album. Uh, great stuff. I mean, I had heard about for years the accolades that were just piled onto this album, and uh, I'll be darned if they weren't pretty much worth it. I mean, if, if you've been looking for an excuse to try and delve into blues, to dip your toe into blues music, uh, this is one of the first ones I would recommend. Just excellent, excellent stuff. I mean, I, I could name the entire track list, but yeah, as I said, uh, each one is... Uh, I have an extended review of each one in my uh, Backtracks uh, playlist. But yeah, go there if you want to learn more. But yeah, excellent, fantastic blues album. First rate. Coming in at number six on my list is Freaky Styley by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Uh, now, the, the Chili Peppers are kind of an exception. Uh, when it comes to when it, when it comes time for me to choose a Backtrack Spotlight album each month, I try to pick an artist that I've never listened to a full album from before. Uh, but Chili Peppers are obviously an exception. I have all three of their Rick Rubin produced albums in my uh, collection. And uh, speaking of Rick Rubin, it's kind of an interesting. This is an interesting album to listen to because. Uh, this was released in 1985, incidentally, uh, my pop, my most popular spotlight here this year. Um, this was well before they had really firmly established themselves into that heavy funk sound that they had in their Rick Rubin albums, but there's traces of it uh, on throughout this album in places. But yeah, a very, very fun album to, to listen to. I'm uh, happy that I took a chance and got to check out some of their early discography, because uh, with probably most people, I'm more into their later stuff. But yeah, I am very uh, anxious to check out some of their other early albums. But yeah, this was a, a very good place to start. If you haven't listened to this one yet, check it out. Now, my number five favorite Backtrack Spotlight album of the year is actually the most recent one that I covered just uh, last month in December. It is Horses by Patti Smith, a, a great album. And I, I avoided it for, for forever because of the fact that Patti Smith is associated with the punk genre. I've never been a big fan of punk. But uh, this one, kind of like The Clash's London Calling, uh, this showed me how wrong I was to just pigeonhole punk as as punk. Uh, this is just such a dimensional album, just like The Clash was. Uh, lots of great stuff on here. Fantastic. These the, the two tracks on there that are like nine, ten minutes long or whatever they are. Uh, fascinating stuff. And uh, the, the closing track, Elegy, is just so delicate. I never would have expected such a delicate side out of Patti Smith. But yeah, it just goes to show me that, uh, you know, I was wrong to just prejudge an artist based on their big singles. Yeah, I just, I, I should know better, but, well, guess who you're talking to. Now, my fourth ranked Spotlight album of the year was also released in 1975, just like Patti Smith's Horses. It is Blood on the Tracks by Bob Dylan. And it, it took me forever to get into Bob Dylan. Uh, any, anything beyond his most popular singles, like, uh, like a Rolling Stone, I love that song. It's one of my favorite songs of all time. Uh, despite that, I had never really gotten into Bob Dylan much until just recently. But yeah, phenomenal album. E excellent. And this one was actually, I made the choice for this one for last January based on the recommendation of a close friend of mine who cites this as his favorite Dylan album. So it's just, and I can see why. It's just fantastic. Uh, great lyrics, as we can come to expect from Bob Dylan. Uh, you know, would you expect otherwise? And, and fantastic musicianship and just excellent. Uh, yeah, he, he was, uh, I think pretty much he had yet to come down from his peak in the mid 70s. So yeah, wonderful, amazing album. Now at number three, we have Three by Led Zeppelin. And no, I didn't do that on purpose. I swear, it's just where the numbers landed. Uh, but yes, phenomenal album. And again, Zeppelin is yet another one of those artists that I kind of pigeonholed, I mean, not completely, not not as much as Patti Smith or The Clash in the punk category, but I just kind of assumed that Zeppelin was all hard rock, even though 
I mean, I knew better because of you know their their quieter, moodier singles like uh, a Stairway to Heaven and such. But uh, but still, this one took me by surprise. I just it won me over big time. Was ten times better than I expected it would be. Just a fantastic set of songs. You guys, I probably don't even need to talk about the songs themselves because you guys know Led Zeppelin is just fantastic and. Uh, this was the first time that I did a repeat appearance by an artist for a Spotlight album. I uh, uh, spotlit um, Houses of the Holy back in 2018, I think it was, and it was just as won over by that one, so it's only a matter of time before I'm going to have their complete discography on vinyl, album by album, and because it's just I, I, it's, ugh, fantastic. What can I say? And yet, despite how obviously speechless at a loss for words I was with uh, Led Zeppelin III, Two other albums actually beat it, in my opinion, uh, to uh, the top spots for album of the year, spotlight album of the year for me. Number two is Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd. Who else is going to beat Zeppelin but Pink Floyd, right? It's a, another phenomenal album, and Pink Floyd is, yet again, another artist that uh, I just neglected for far, far too long. And confession time, but with an explanation. Uh, I had never checked out an album by Pink Floyd until I picked up a rather battered CD copy of Dark Side of the Moon off the freebie shelf at House of Records. So yeah, it took a free CD for me to try out Pink Floyd at all. But in, in my defense, weak as it might be, uh, Pink Floyd is one of those artists whose reputation was intimidating to me. Kind of like David Bowie. Bowie is in the same uh, same kind of uh, frame in, in that respect. Just their reputation and their catalog just kind of has in intimidated me. But again, you know, the loss was mine after uh, neglecting them for so long. Uh, this album, just as much as Pink Floyd uh, or Dark Side of the Moon won me over at first, this one won me over three times more. And I'm just, I'm only going to pick up more of their albums. Uh, Floyd is uh, one of the favorite bands of all time of one of my dear friends. And he recommended this one as well as another one that I'm going to, which is probably going to be the next one I check out. But yeah, amazing, phenomenal uh, album. And again, much like Ze Ze Zeppelin Three, you probably don't me need me to describe it to you. It's just amazing album. Number two in my Spotlight Albums of the Year. Okay, now, number one time. And I know what you guys are saying out there. A lot of you are saying, if Zeppelin was number three and Pink Floyd was number two, what's number one? Who's going to beat Zeppelin and Floyd? Well, those of you who have been watching my channel all this time uh, probably already know what this album is going to be because I raved and raved and raved about it during its Spotlight Month back in June. And it is Chavez Ravine by Ry Cooter. This album moved me like no other album did. Spotlight, well, obviously, because it's number one. But yes, it is fantastic. And to give you an idea, this is a concept album, and I have never been one for concept albums. And it is at the top of my Spotlight album list. And to give you a little context, uh, I grew up down in the uh, Los Angeles area, down in California, and my father took me and my brother to five or six LA Dodgers baseball games every year when we were growing up there. And Dodger Stadium is now built it's located in Chavez Ravine, and it was built on the site of a Mexican-American community. And so, uh, and that is what this album is about. It's it's about that community. That's why it's called Chavez Ravine. And so, you know, I, I'm not nearly the fan of baseball now that I was back then. I, I, not that I ever was a huge fan of baseball, but I don't think I could ever set foot in Dodger Stadium again after hearing the stories on this album. And this is something that I never knew the story, of, the backstory of Chavez Ravine until I listen to this album. And not only is the music outstanding, it's got, you know, some Mexican folk songs as well as some covers of uh, certain songs. I couldn't tell you what they are right now. Sorry, off the top of my head. Uh, and, and as well as uh, original compositions by Ry Cooter. Uh, and it's just fantastic. And so many different moods uh, in this album as well. Uh, and But look at the book here. I mean, it talks about, it has the lyrics from each song in Spanish and English. Uh, and uh, also some about some of the songs it has uh, a paragraph or two of context, putting this, each song into the context of the story of Chavez Ravine. So, you know, but I mean, it's not just the presentation. It is the music. It is just absolutely fantastic. I, I loved it. And as I said, it absolutely moved me like no other album did this year. It was wonderful. And it is very, very justifiably and deservedly my number one favorite backtrack spotlight album of the year by a mile. Well, that was quite a journey there, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, I guess it was a really good year for Backtracks, as, as good a year as it was for Bargain Bag as well. So, And I'm looking forward to continuing both features on into 2021, coming up uh, very soon in the next couple of weeks here. 
But anyway, that'll do it for this episode of my 2020 year-end spectacular-ish. Be sure and tune in for the next video, which is the big one, my countdown of my 25 favorite albums of 2020. But I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, hit that like button and share it with your friends. And give me your thoughts, questions, suggestions, or constructive criticisms in the comment section below. Also, scroll down to the description for the links to my Twitter and Instagram feeds, and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.